Hello everyone, I am Dr. Balakrishnan Nandya and this video is prepared for MAPC students of Igno. You know, many of our students may have some background in psychology. They might have undergone some courses in psychology. But I think that it is desirable to start from the scratch before jumping into the water. Is it not better to understand how deep it is and what are the undercurrents in it? There, in the same way, before we start exploring the various aspects of the subject, it is always desirable to understand what the subject is. To begin with, I will quote a humorous definition given by R. S. Woodworth, Robert S. Woodworth, the author of the Contemporary Schools of Psychology. He said, at first psychology lost its soul, then it lost its mind. Later on, it lost its consciousness. However, it has behavior of some sort. See, he was referring to the etymology of psychology, the word psychology, the Greek word psyche and logos. Psyche means soul, logos means science. Soul is an abstract term. Nobody knows where soul is. It cannot be touched and or felt or measured. How can a scientific study be made on such a metaphysical term? Science deals with matter. So soul and science, they will not go together. And somebody said, instead of soul, let us use mind. Because soul is the monopoly of some spiritual leaders in the present day. But in those days, the Greek word soul simply meant mind. So, psychology of mind, that was the later definition. Again, the same question uh, came. Whether mind is concrete matter, can it be measured, can it be observed? It was at this time that psychology had a sl slightly empirical stat. A German psychologist, Willem Wundt, and his disciple, a British psychologist called Edward B. Titchener, and the American psychologist, William James, they all started scientific explanation about human behavior. They substituted the word mind into consciousness and believed that consciousness can be uh, split into its elements like a sensation, feeling and images. You know the splitting tendency is from physics and chemistry, in, especially from chemistry. The advancements in physics, chemistry and biology influence psychology also. From the state of a mental philosophy, it achieved the status of a science because of these advancements in various aspects of uh, this science, splitting tendency. So, science of consciousness was the next term. See, consciousness also is highly subjective. Science cannot deal with subjectivity. Therefore, people like J.B. Watson, the founder of a behavioristic school of psychology, he wanted to make it a paka science, a pure science. So, he was not happy with the term consciousness. To measure consciousness, introspection was 
used by William James, William Bond, etc. Introspection is highly subjective, looking to oneself and reporting. So, he wanted to define psychology as a science of behavior. Of course, the modern definition of psychology, I think the best definition is, psychology is the biosocial science of behavior and experience. You know, there are different terms in, used in this definition. First term is biosocial. Biosocial means biological as well as sociological. It's a biological science as well as sociological science. It's called biological science because psychology attempts to study, study the behavior of living organisms. It's called a biological science also because psychology is interested in the function of the brain, nervous system, chemicals in the body, physiological functions. So it's, it's a biological science. It's called a social science because the influence of social agencies from family, peer group, uh, unto mass media in shaping human behavior is taken into account. So it's called a biosocial uh, science. Science, that is an extra term in the definition. Science is not the name of any subject like physics or chemistry or biology. Science is a method of inquiry. This method of inquiry is characterized by objectivity. There is no subjectivity in science. No personal biases or prejudices. Tangibility. Science deals with matter that can be touched and felt. Manipulability. We can administer certain quantity and observe the effect of that uh, exactly, that, that manipulability. Science also believes in quantifying things. So quantifiability, the effects can be quantified. The manipulated effect as well as the observed effect. The independent variable and dependent variable in the terminology of science. It can be quantified. Another most important point is that science is replicable. Replicable, the word replicable involves two words in it, repeat and duplicate. Replicate. The same observation, if another person, irrespective of temporal or spatial differences, gets the same finding conducted by a psychologist in one part of the world. That quality is called replicability. That can be, the findings can be repeated under the same conditions. Therefore, we call it a duplicate. Right? Same conditions can be repeated and the findings can be measured. And the last and very most important characteristics of science is it is empirical. It is not the hearsay or it is not the revelations of a silver tongued orator. We, you, we depend upon the silver tongued orators for very many things. Aristotle said to Socrates said to Vivekananda said science does not believe in these silver tongued orators verbalizations or revelations. Instead, science look for evidences substantiating the statement made by the scientist. It is therefore a very humorous statement about the difference between philosopher and scientist was made by 
some others. When the philosopher takes his hypothesis to the laboratory for testing, he becomes a scientist. Because the effect should be quantified. If anything exists, it exists in some quantity. If it exists in some quantity, it is quantifiable. This was their argument. Let's go to the next term used in the definition. We have seen biosocial science. The next term is behavior. Behavior, it embraces to its domain so many things. It is the repertoire of responses, the whole gamut of responses, the observable, measurable behavior, the prenatal behavior to the senescent behavior. It's very important. The normal behavior as well as the abnormal behavior. Psychologist is interested in both normal as well as abnormal. The conscious behavior, pre-conscious behavior and unconscious behavior as Freud insisted. We are interested in all this. The last term in this definition is experience. Not being satisfied by the term behavior, to clarify it further, this experience, this word experience also has been integrated with the definition. Experience refers to the covert inner behavior, our feelings, our thoughts, our cognitive functions. It not necessarily be observable by others. Our thinking, our feeling, our attitudes, our motivational aspects. I just cite an example. The crying behavior of a baby. We can observe the behavior of the baby. We can see how many uh, times the baby uh, takes his breath inside. He sobs, number of sobs per minute. Tears coming out of the right eye as well as the left eye, we can quantify it and then compare it using a pipette or a burette. But will it help us to understand the actual cause of crying? A child may cry for pain, for hunger, for anger, for loneliness. For very many such experiences, inner experience, the child may be crying. So crying is a behavior, experience is the causes behind, inner unobservable causes behind the behavior. So I repeat the definition, psychology is a biosocial science of behavior and experience. In my next presentation, I intend to give you the six major approaches for understanding human behavior. Thank you very much for patient listening. I expect your feedback. Thank you.